Hi, in the previous video we talked about different measurements including the time and then we talked about length uh, we briefly talked about mass um, about the electronic balance and the zero error and now let's move on to talk about measuring volume there are mainly two ways of finding out the volume if you're lucky to have a regular object like the one that I show in the diagram here then you can rely on the mathematical formula to calculate the volume here maybe I didn't specify it well enough it should be calculate instead of measuring all right because uh, there's a difference between calculating and measuring measuring is you have the tool to measure well to find out the volume directly and for calculating what you do is that is for example if you are trying to find out the volume of these you are actually measuring the length measuring the width measuring the height and you can use this formula to calculate okay so that will make a difference uh, in the future when you do calculation and your lab report as well however this way of finding out the volume is not being much appreciated in physics do you know why The problem is that in real life, you would not be able to find such a perfect regular solid. So this approach is only applicable or useful when you cannot measure it directly. Then you can use this way to calculate, to estimate the volume of it. So for the other method, I will talk about it later when we are on this section. So let me finish talking about measuring the volume of a liquid first. So on your screen, you can see there are three kinds of glassware you may choose for measuring the volume of a liquid. Here is a conical flask. In the middle, this is called the measuring cylinder. And lastly, this is called the beaker. Probably you have used all of these in junior science. The question I would like to ask you is, in physics, we always use measuring cylinder for measuring the volume of a liquid instead of the other two. Can you explain why? Alright, the answer is similar to what you learned when we talk about measuring the length. Do you remember vernier Kelepa and micrometer? Why do we need that? Comparing to the ruler, for micrometer and vernier Kelepa, they will have a much, much greater precision. So same for the measuring cylinder, it will have greater precision. And in case you don't know what it means, then you can explain here. Greater precision means that for the error that you will measure, the, it will be much smaller because the smallest interval or smallest division, I think division is a better word, uh, is smaller comparing to the other. So for example, for these Measuring cylinder, actually I can see here, it's at plus or minus 0 0.2 mil. Alright, and I think that's actually true. Yeah, because this is 8, this is 6, this is 7, and in between there are 5 intervals. So 0 0.2 for each interval. As if you look at the beaker, I think this one is saying 50 mil. And so this is 0, 10, 20, 30, 40. Actually it's strange, like, I don't know why this is in order. But anyway, between the interval, it is actually 10 mil. So that means you can only determine your substance, or well, liquid here, uh, to have a plus or minus 5 mil only, right? Because you only do up, go up to a particular interval here. For example, if uh, you somehow has 26 mil, then you will kind of seeing, oh, it's closer to 30, so you go for 30 mil instead. So. Uh, this would be an error that you produce when you take the measurement. Same for measuring cylinder, but the one in the measuring cylinder is much smaller. As for conical flask, you can see the same as well. The interval is much larger, 20, 30, and 40. So it's the same as the beaker. So we don't want to use that in physics. Next, when you use the measuring cylinder, there is something you need to pay attention to, and that is called the parallax error. For example, here you have got 
some liquid inside the mesh cylinder and the liquid will actually form a curve on the surface we call it meniscus meniscus is due to the surface tension of the water and for different kind of substance it may be different even for different temperature it will be different as well so for example uh, when you have mercury then you can see that this is actually inverted instead right so for water it is something like uh, this one curve like this which is uh, what you will see in this picture or right, curve like this but then uh, for mercury it will be the other way around so it all depends on the material you use and so uh, the problem will be how do we actually read the volume there because you can see uh, it actually covers several interval at once so let me ask you a question here as an example uh, there are three different way of seeing it a, B, and C. So A will probably read this one as it. This should be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Yeah, so this one should be 27 from A. Tw uh, B will be 25. And then C will be 20, 1, 2, 3, 23. Okay, so you can see that uh, even for the same sort of liquid and measuring cylinder, with different perspective, you see different things. So which one? do you think should be the one that we are taking and record it down? The answer is actually B. Okay, so 25. That means you have to look at the bottom of the meniscus. Okay, the bottom of this. Then you may say, hey, Mr. Wong, then this is not fair because if you try to zoom in and think about the actual volume that it occupied, uh, you can see that, hey, there's actually some extra liquid here. Why don't we account for that? And the answer is that for the measuring cylinder that we use, they actually have a special design already. At the bottom of the measuring cylinder, it's not actually flat, right? It's actually curved as well. So that kind of compensate for this extra volume. So that's why you can feel comfortable to just take the bottom of the meniscus in your reading. So make sure next time when you take the reading, you're looking at that. And also when you look at, at the angle, this should be 90 degrees. So you're kind of, your eyesight is also perpendicular uh, to the measuring cylinder itself. So for the answer here, I will just say B. And the reason behind is simply that uh, it will have no parallel error. Parallel error. All right, while A and C will have parallel error. Notice that for parallel error, you should also have such an awareness towards all the other measurement tools as well, including a ruler or here, uh, there's a clock. For example, if you look at this picture, it will be a very good illustration. Imagine you've got a clock or you, you, if you have one at home, you can try it out. If you try to see uh, the clock from like the right direction, like normally how you see it, versus left or right, you'll find out something like this in the picture. I mean, this is not a clock, but this is a uh, thermometer. You can see the one in the middle actually read about 82, I think. Yeah, it should be 82. And the one on the left actually read about 90. Of course, that, that's quite extreme. I mean, I don't, I don't think you would do that. But then if you look at the needle and the scale itself, you can see it's already distort when you uh, tilt at a certain angle. So it looks like 90, which is not correct, obviously. And the one on the right will be underestimated. It will be around, I think, 76. Or in this case, well, again, the correct one should be 82. So... That's why parallel error is something that is very important and you should always pay attention to when you do measurement. And let me show you a simulation first. This is a simulation which I'll put a link in the description below. I actually use Flash, which is a kind of old system and it will got fade out uh, in the system by the end of this year. So I don't know whether or not it will still work on your computer. If not, then you can just watch uh, my video here. Uh, but I would strongly recommend you try it out if you can do it. So I'm not sure if you know, when you put an object into the water or any kind of liquid, it would display 
part of it. Depending on the density of the substance, that means the solid and the liquid, uh, it will have different amounts. So for example, you can see uh, wood here is less dense than water. So that's why it floats like what we mentioned earlier. If I change it to something like a brick or aluminium, let's say aluminium, if I drop it, it will just simply sink into the water. And you can see the water level got changed when it get into it because the solid, whatever that is, will take up space and the water will kind of get squeezed uh, to the other part of the space. So that's why it go higher. So if you have a way to measure the volume of the water, then you can basically measure the volume of the solid. Do you notice that this doesn't related like this doesn't really relate to the density of the object. So for example here with the same volume, this is brick and you can see the change is five liter only. If I change it to aluminum with the same size, if I drop it, even though this is heavier, the change of volume is still the same. For lighter object, not lighter object, less dense object, then you can see that only part of it will be submerged. So for this one, uh, we'll have to talk about it later, how we can actually measure density of this. Uh, but then you can, I mean, using my mouse, I can still kind of press it down so that you can still see uh, in terms of the volume here, it is five if this is fully submerged. So this is a hint for you to think about uh, when you have something that is less dense, you can try to think about this uh, in the experiment. So I think you should be able to guess how it works now. What you can do is you can prepare a measuring cylinder with some water inside because water is simply accessible. So you may want to fill up the water for a certain level, which of course you can ensure that the solid later on when you submerge to it, uh, it is fully covering the whole solid. If you do too little, then of course it's not uh, gonna work. So what you can do first as a step one is you can fill up the water and then remember you have to read the level first. So this is the initial reading you need to read. And the second step is uh, simply put the rock inside. So this is one, this is two, uh, or any other thing. So the best part of this method is it doesn't really matter what kind of shape that you are using. You know, just now we talk about uh, other shape like uh, spherical or cubic or um, pyramid, cylinder, etc. Uh, those would need to follow a certain like, specific shape so that you can use the mathematical formula to calculate. And it, again, it has also have to consider the uh, imperfection of the edge or of the shape itself. But for this method, it is so good because you don't even need to care about uh, the shape itself. It could be something that is completely irregular you can still measure its volume. So step one, step two is done. Last step is to simply read the volume, uh, the final volume, and then you can find out the volume of the rock. So V rock will equals to the delta V of the reading. So delta V uh, in physics, delta means the change. So change in the volume of your reading or you can say uh, V2 minus V1, all right, the final reading V2 and the initial reading V1. If you don't like to do the subtraction for some reason, then you can consider using the other approach called the displacement can. People also call it the Archimedes can because it's invented by Archimedes, one of the philosophers in the past. So the can in itself, it was empty when you use it at the first place. So the shape is like very simple can with an outlet like this. Uh, the first step when you do it is you have to fill this up with water until it starts to drip. So say if you just you know randomly, uh, mindlessly add, keep adding water, uh, the water will flow out. And after it stop dripping the water from the outlet, uh, we are very sure that the water level must be at the at this level. Okay, already at this level already. So whenever you put anything inside, the water will simply overflow and come out. So that's why in the picture here, uh, this guy, when he tried to put the rock 
inside the water, then uh, there will be some water coming out. So if you try to measure the volume of this, this will simply be the volume of the rock itself. So here is some other video I would like you to uh, watch as well. So you can see just now, uh, the person here drop a metal in it. You can see the water level get higher. And so again, this is an illustration of displacement. And you can find the change in the reading. And that is the change of the volume. And so you can find the volume of the Kent. When you try to choose the measuring cylinder, you would want to choose the one that it would be smallest, but will be able to fit the object that you are measuring. Again, this is an idea to increase your precision when you're doing the measurement. So this guy is taking up the initial reading of the volume. Again, remember the parallax error. And he starts to put the block inside. You can see he tried to carefully, gently put this and slide this in. Because if you simply drop it, then the water will splash out and the measurement that you make earlier will just not be reliable. And again, uh, try to avoid the parallax error by looking at it uh, with the eyesight line, sight of line that is perpendicular to the measuring cylinder itself. Then you can find out the difference. To see whether you understand what you learned in this video, I would like you to do the question on page 17. This is a question about how to measure the density in the practical situation. So please pause the video, try it out, and I'll explain the answers to you. A few moments later. Okay, in this question, uh, what you get to use is a measuring cylinder and a spring balance. Spring balance is those kind of balance you use to measure the force. Uh, some people call it Newton meter or call it force meter. So you want to use these two tools to find the density of a stone. So the first thing that you want to do is uh, think of how to use the measuring cylinder in part one. And what you can say about is uh, you can say first step is to fill uh, water into the measuring cylinder. Okay, I'm just lazy here. You can spell the whole name. Number two is to um, take the initial reading or I think the better word is to record to use the word record record the initial reading of the measuring cylinder and then number three is to put the sample rock sample uh, into the measuring cylinder gently and uh, gently number four because you don't again you don't want to splash the water so lastly uh, again you have to record the final reading of the measuring cylinder and I do think this should be enough but then to play safe in the exam I will also add one more sentence that is uh, by subtracting the two readings we can find the volume of the rock Okay, but I don't think this is necessary because it only asks you to state what reading you take. Okay, and for number two, it's asking you how the spring balance is used and states the reading that is uh, taken. And since I suppose a rock is, is more like irregular shape, so there shouldn't be any uh, hook or hole where you can, you know, pass through the spring balance. You know, there's a hook there. Uh, to hang it up there. So I guess uh, you may want to suggest to uh, firstly use a light string because you don't want the string, the mass of the string itself affects your reading. Use a string to wrap the rock and then you will hang the rock on the spring balance okay and then you can uh, take the reading or record down 
of its mass. Okay, I suppose you can read the mass. Uh, although normally when we use the spring balance or force meter, we are reading the force. But then the one that I use usually, there are two weight scales. So uh, it also show the equivalent mass um, to you directly. So you don't have to do any calculation by converting the force, which is the weight, to the mass. Number three is asking you about how you can use the equation to calculate the density. So simply is, uh, I will, I will write down the word equation. So in case you write this, I don't recommend. Uh, unless you can say, oh, rho is density, m is mass, v is volume. But then uh, I would say in, in this way, I think I would do density equals to mass divide volume. Lastly, it's asking you um, a scenario where a student want to find the density of a cork. In case you don't know what it is, uh, it's basically those are to stop the wine from coming out. Uh, some people may call it simply a stopper. So obviously, uh, the special thing about this is this is less dense than water. So if you use the approach that we do with the measuring cylinders, drop it, then it will be floating, just like the simulation I showed you earlier with the wood floating on top of the water. So uh, you have to suggest how we can change so that we can still measure its density. First of all, for the mass, we don't actually have to change anything. We can still use the way that we do, uh, use a light string to wrap around with this and to just measure it directly. But then for the volume, it's a bit more tricky and there are two ways of doing it. Uh, one way that you may write down is simply uh, use your finger or use some sort of uh, tool like a glass rod or anything. I would just say, I think finger is actually fine. Uh, use finger to push the cork until it is fully submerged in water. Because only when the object is fully covered by the water, then the change of water level would be exactly the same as the volume of the object that you put in. Be careful, don't push too much, because if you push too much, then the volume of your fingertip will also be accountable as well. So you have to be very cool with this. Uh, if you don't like to do this, then the other way of doing it is uh, you can find a heavy, so use a heavy, known mass such as a metal block or the rock that you just find out um, yeah maybe maybe like the rock simply uh, let, let's just say the rock right actually it's not heavy but uh, dense because only when you are having a substance that is denser than water can hopefully uh, what you can do is you can have the measuring cylinder this is water and so firstly what you do is you put uh, the cork there and it's supposed to be floating right so it's supposed to be like probably like here instead all right but then what you can do is you can put the rock in and it will kind of help you to push push it down so then uh, it will be probably something like this all right at the end and since you know uh, the volume of the rock, then you can do the calculation by yourself. Uh, again, of course, you still need to read, take the reading, initial and final, but then you also need to minus the volume of the rock as well. So then you can then find the actual volume uh, for whatever object you want to find. In this case, that will be the cork here. So as a summary, in this video, we learn about how to measure the volume of a regular solid uh, which is not really recommended. Uh, we also learn how to measure the volume of a liquid using measuring cylinder. And then we talk about parallel error, how to take the reading. And then we talk about how to measure the volume of the irregular solid by using the displacement method. All right. And if you are wondering what happened to gas, volume of the gas then, uh, that will be way more complicated and we may cover that in the future. Thanks for watching, I'll see you again in the next video.